Thank you for listening. This has been the Bread of the Word podcast. Bread of the Word is a podcast ministry striving to feed people the wonderful words of God, book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse, striving to let the word speak for itself. This ministry is also a member of the Truth and Love Network, a diverse fellowship of fellow podcasts of different theological backgrounds united in the gospel of God. For more from the Bread of the Word podcast or the Truth and Love Network, check out the links below and follow us on social media. Until next time, God bless. Matthew 4.4
He is a well-watered plant in the sunshine. His shoots spread out over his garden. His roots are intertwined around a pile of rocks. He looks for a home among the stones. If he is uprooted from his place, it will deny knowing him, saying, I never saw you. Surely this is the joy of his way of life, and yet others will sprout from the dust. Look, God does not reject a person of integrity, and he will not support evildoers. He will fill your mouth with laughter, and your lips with a shout of joy. Your enemies will be clothed with shame, and the tent of the wicked will no longer exist. So right off the bat, he starts off with four. And of course, when we see the word four, as my friend John likes to say, we've got to ask, what's, what's, what's it there for? What is the there for? And so in light of what we saw last week with God does not pervert justice, that God is just in all that he does, he says, ask the previous generations and pay attention to what their ancestors discovered. So while Eliphaz staked his foundation for his argumentation on experience. And this is what God has been like in my life. And this is how I've come to understand God. Bildad says, look to tradition. Look to your ancestors. Essentially, look to the wisdom of people before you. Look to the, the old people. Since you were born only yesterday, and you know nothing. Sidebar, I think the same thing could be said about Bildad, and honestly about many of us. <laughs> I've really struggled with these chapters in Job, in part because I see a little bit of myself in these knuckleheads. That I, I know how bullheaded I can be. And then one of the things that God has been working in my heart in the last couple of years is being less obtuse and rigid and impractical when it comes to theology and the knowledge of God. They've got a lot of knowledge here, but there's no, there's no wisdom here. And their view of God is very rigid to the point that it's unhelpful. I think that's a caveat to every single one of us, whether you are called to, quote, deep theology, or if, like me, you're just a lay person in the church that every single one of us can fall in that same ditch. And the thing that keeps us from going there is not us being smarter. It's about God giving us wisdom. Bildad is incredibly rigid in his view, not just of God, but of his the way he works. That it's it's almost mechanical. It's it's like a vending machine that you punch in these buttons and you select the product you want, and out comes the product. But Job pushed all the right buttons and didn't get the product. And so Bildad's entire concept of the universe is broken to pieces by Job just being here. <clears throat> Because all of the, quote, the collective wisdom of the ancestors would have us believe this should happen. But instead of A, B, and C happening, Job got E, F, G. Something does not fit here. But Bildad implores Job to look to the past, look to tradition. Because they will teach you and speak from their understanding. Does papyrus grow where there is no marsh? Do reeds flourish without water? While still uncut sh shoots, they would dry up quicker than any other plant. Of course, these questions, we look at these and we, we're kind of inclined to go, uh, duh, of course, reeds do not flourish if they lack water. But there's something, <clears throat> there's something about that scenario he's applying to people. And he says, such is the destiny of all who forget God. Other translations say, such are the ways. The hope of the godless will perish. And so again, we have that accusatory, Job, you have messed up. You have done the wrong thing. 
and God is justified, he is vindicated in his dealings with you because you have sinned. And there are times where God does bring affliction on people who are in sin. There, there is somewhat of a precedence for that in the Old Testament. We've considered some of this with Hosea and Jonah and Deuteronomy. But it doesn't apply here. And so regardless of what tradition says, regardless of what the past has to say about Moses and the prophets, if we want to apply that, if we're going to, we're going to go from what is past from our perspective, we would look to Moses and the prophets but if Job is the first book to be written, they're not looking to the Bible, necessarily. They're looking to word of mouth. They're looking to, quite literally, their family history. They're looking at stories from the village. And staking that as the standard. That so-and-so down the road had this happen, and he did X, Y, Z, and he was fine. He got these desired results. <clears throat> so if Job is experiencing the same thing, it's because he needs to do the same thing that so-and-so down the street did. And I can't help but think about the Pharisees and how Jesus straight up told them that they had presented their own traditions as commandments of God. And how often do we do the same thing? How often do we add to what is expected? We can take that all the way back to Genesis 2. We can go all the way back to the Garden of Eden and see that inclination. If we go <clears throat> back to the Garden, verse 10, A river went out from Eden to water the Garden. From there it divided and became the source of four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon, which flows through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. Gold from that land is pure, but Delium and Onyx are also there. The name of the second river is Gihon, which flows through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris, which runs east of Assyria, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. These are all rivers that the ancient world saw as being the, I guess, the lifeblood of culture. You know, the, the land of Mesopotamia. Mesopot I'm sorry, Mesopotamia, was nestled between the Tigris and the Euphrates River, so much so that Mesopotamia literally means the land between the rivers. And so these four rivers are considered as being pinnacle to the formation of the ancient world. And so Genesis starts here. and says, The Lord God took the man and placed him in the Garden of Eden at the source of where these rivers go out. And he placed them in the Garden of Eden, what to work it and watch over it. And the Lord God commanded the man. This is the commandment of God. I, I, I just think this is so cool. That the commandment of God is, you are free to eat from any tree of the garden. He doesn't start with, you shall not, or you will do. He says, you are free to eat from any tree of the garden to put it as painfully literal with the Hebrew as you can, eatingly you may eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day you eat of it, you will die. Dyingly you will die. You will certainly die. So that is the command. You are free to eat from every tree of the garden of good, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For the day you eat of it, you will die. And if we go further into chapter 2, I'm sorry, into chapter 3, when we have the introduction of the serpent, and he speaks to Eve and says, Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? First of all, that's not the commandment. But the woman plays the same game and says to the serpent, We may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden said you must not eat it, or touch it, or you will die. You see what I'm seeing? See what I'm saying here? That right off the bat, things are being twisted. Things are being reinterpreted. 
And we have a tendency to add two things just as naturally, just as freely. And that's not always a good thing. When it comes to the things of God, we have a tendency to reinterpret God in a way we would see fit. We have a tendency to try to make God in our image, in our likeness. To try to reshape God into a, a frame that is more palatable, more appealing to us, that better fits what we want him to be. And this is honestly something we've been considering with the last couple of sections in Job. Is God bigger than our questions? Is God bigger than our boxes that we try to fit him in? I mean, here I think the question is, is God God? Because the assumption is that Job is experiencing what he's experiencing because reeds do not flourish when they lack water. And such is the destiny of all who forget God, and the hope of the godless, it says, will perish. Which is very similar to Psalm chapter 1, verse 6. It says, For the Lord knoweth the ways of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. The CSB puts it as the way of the unrighteous shall lead to ruin. And so it's very in line with that. And he says, His source of confidence is fragile. What he trusts in is a spider's web, and he leans on it, but it doesn't stand firm. He grabs it, but it does not hold up. There's a lot to that that is true about us, that we tend to look for other confidence, other senses of security and stability. And sometimes that is external from God, and sometimes, like Bildad, that is us trying to remake God in an image that we would better, would prefer him to be. Bildad's view of God is very mechanical, to the extent that some commentators I've read do not believe that he truly knew God. And so, much of what is said here could just as well be applied to Bildad himself. That his confidence may well be a spider's web. Because his conceptualization of who God is seems more committed to the system than the designer. He also can, describes those who, for, who forget God in verse 16 as he is a well-watered plant in the sunshine. His shoots spread out over his garden, and his roots are intertwined around a pile of rocks. He looks for a home among the stones. If he is uprooted from his place, it will deny knowing him, saying, I never saw you. The New Testament is all over those words. <clears throat> because in that, I see similarities to when Jesus tells the parable of the sower. That's, God is like one who goes out and sows seeds, and they land all over the place. They land in fertile ground, they land in, in, in the rocks, they land among thorns. And every scenario that he describes is one case, one person who receives, who is given the gospel, who's given the words of God. Some, it lent that, that truth, the truth, lands on fertile soil and it grows and it has deep roots and it flourishes and there are others where the roots are intertwined around a pile of rocks where it does not truly take hold because there's nothing to grow it 
He looks for a home among the stones. And if he is uprooted from his place, it will deny him, saying, I never saw you. Because Jesus also said that many will come on that day saying, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in, in thy name? Did we not cast out demons in thy name? And Jesus responds, Depart from me. I have never known you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. And in the case of, case of Job, this is applied as being a picture of Job's impermanence. That you are the one whose roots are wrapped around stones. That your confidence, your sense of security shall abandon you. And this is the joy of the way of life. Yet others will sprout from the dust. It's not you, but others will, will come out of this and flourish. Again, it's very accusatory that Job is the problem. Why? Because God does not reject a person of integrity, and he will not support evildoers. But he will fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with a shout of joy. So Bildad insinuates that this is not true about Job. Because he says that God will fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with a shout of joy. That the reason you have none of that is because you are an evildoer. Because God has rejected you. Because you are not a person of integrity. Your enemies will be clothed with shame. The turn of the wicked will no longer exist. Again, principle of how this should work. Of the vending machine, you punch in the right buttons, you get this product out. And all of this is presupposed on the assumption that Bildad has God figured out. That much like Captain Ahab in Melville's novel Moby Dick, had all of his maps and all of his charts and all of his diagrams that he had studied the white whale for many years. And he had figured this out to the point that he believed he had circumnavigated the whale as though he had predicted God himself. And likewise, Bildad seems to have figured out God down to a science, down to an idea, to a theory. the harsh reality is that it's not the idea of God that saves anyone. It's not the idea of God that means anything in the midst of trials and suffering. It's God himself that makes the difference. Let us consider Psalm 25 as we draw to a conclusion and we try to put legs on this and put legs on the right stuff one of the challenges with Job is is applying it because there's a lot of good stuff there's a lot of what Bildad and Eliphaz and Zophar say that's true it's just misapplied and so what do we learn in terms of application from what they got wrong and I could think of no better place in Psalm 25. Lord, I appeal to you. My soul, my God, I trust in you. The King James says, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. My God, I trust in you. Do not let me be disgraced. Do not let my enemies glit over me. No one who waits for you will be disgraced. Those who act treacherously without cause will be disgraced. Verse 4, make your ways known to me, God. Teach me your paths, guide me in your truth, and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. 
like, I wait for you all day long. Remember, Lord, your compassion and your faithful love, for they have existed from antiquity. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my acts of rebellion. In keeping with your faithful love, remember me because of your goodness, Lord. The Lord is good and upright, therefore he shows sinners the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All the Lord's ways show faithful love and truth to those who keep his covenant and decrees. Lord, for the sake of your name, forgive my iniquity, for it is immense. God is more complicated than our systems, than our boxes, than our questions. He's bigger than it all. He is bigger than the bumper stickers we would like to confine him to. But nonetheless, the Lord is good and upright, and he shows sinners the way. That he shows broken people people broken by sin who he is that while God is in heaven and does whatsoever he hath pleased God has been pleased to make himself known to us despite the fact that we are not perfect that we are as it says in Jeremiah 17 the heart is deceitfully wicked who can understand it and despite that God has made himself known to us. To the point that St. Paul says in Acts 17 that the God who made the world does not live in temples made by human hands, neither is he served by, by man as if he needed anything, but gives freely to all. And those, and him who was a mystery I proclaim to you. Because he's not still a mystery. He's not still unknown and invisible and unattainable, unreachable. God has made himself not just known to us, but available to us. Romans 5.1 says that we have access to God. That one of the benefits of this thing we call salvation is, is God. Again, it's not just the idea of God, but it's God himself. Romans 5 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified, by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We also have obtained access through him by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we also boast in our afflictions because we know that affliction produces endurance and endurance produces proven character, and proven character produces hope. And this hope will not disappoint us, because God is love. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So as we continue to wrestle with the God who is sovereign in our successes and in our afflictions, we can rest in the fact that there is hope in the midst of that. That God has not gone anywhere. But that we still have access to God. That God has made himself available to us four times such as this. And despite the accusations of Bildad, whether that is an external person, that's our own ideas of what God should be if we try to confine him to the vending machine model. God is bigger and more glorious than any of that. 
Because we are saved by God, not just the idea of God. So let us go to the God who simply is, who has never left us and will always be there in triumphs and trials alike. Because this hope does not disappoint. Thank you for listening. This has been the Bread of the Word podcast. Bread of the Word is a podcast ministry striving to feed people the wonderful words of God, book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse, striving to let the word speak for itself. This ministry is also a member of the Truth and Love Network, a diverse fellowship of fellow podcasts of different theological backgrounds united in the gospel of God. For more from the Bread of the Word podcast or the Truth and Love Network, check out the links below and follow us on social media. Until next time, God bless. Matthew 4.4.